Today's reading comes from John 20, 19 through 31. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to, but he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Please now turn to Acts 5, 27 through 39. When they, had, when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We give you strict orders not to teach in, his, in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his at his right hand as leader and savior, so that he might give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named uh, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400 joined them. But he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking of a human origin, it will fail. But if it is God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even found fighting against God. They were convinced by him. This is the word of life. Thank you, Mikey. Please pray with me. Holy God, as we have come before your scripture, may our hearts be open to receive your Holy Spirit. May we let your Holy Spirit in to do the work that only you can do. To free us from fear so that we can be free in the world, living out exactly what it is you're calling us to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Easter may have been last week, but I still like to start off with this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. As we continue in the celebration of Easter, we're starting a new series called Building Bridges, leading us up to Pentecost. Building bridges? Yes, building bridges. It's a focus for us to see how the resurrected Christ has been working in our communities and seeing how we can partner with them to participate in the reign of God on earth. Knowing that God has been showing up on the way, as we talked about last week, believing that God is already out there 
So we're going to be looking at building bridges. And maybe like, like me, maybe you have heard a phrase from this particular pulpit that kind of gets at this same theme of building bridges. The phrase goes like this. If the local church were to close its doors and shut down, would anyone notice? To make it even more particular, if Kingston UMC were to close and no longer be a church, would anyone who's not already a member, anyone in the community, would they notice? It's a tough question, but it's an honest question. It's a paradigm shifting question because it flips the tables around rather than assuming that we as a church exist so that people can come to church. It assumes that our church exists to change the world, to transform the world, to love the world. It assumes that we don't exist for ourselves, but for others. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at building bridges. Today, we come to our passages in John and in Acts. Just after the resurrection, Scripture tells us the, story, the stories of the disciples and Thomas and John, and then the story of the apostles in front of the religious leaders in Acts. And as we continue celebrating this Easter season, I think these passages help us see what responses we can have ourselves to Jesus' resurrection. Looking at the texts, there are four types of characters in the midst of discerning how they can respond to Easter in their contexts. And I think if we journey along with them, we can see how we might be responding today and how we might be able to respond in the future. Looking at John, we have the disciples and Thomas. Looking at Acts, we have the disciples again, and then we have Gamaliel. When I first started reading and rereading these two texts together, I couldn't help but hear how fear seemed to be playing a role in each. In the first, in John, we see that fear is what keeps the disciples inside, behind locked doors, afraid of the religious leaders and what they might do to them. Like the fears we can all carry, this fear entraps and immobilizes them, just as fear does to us. It holds them, and sometimes us, captive. This is where the disciples find themselves right after Jesus' death and resurrection. Although they've heard that Jesus has been raised from the dead, from the women, they still feel trapped, full of fear, unsure of those in power, and what will happen if they go outdoors, if they step outside the boundaries. For some of us, we can feel a similar kind of fear about stepping outside the lines that others have created for us. Although we know the resurrection story and the power of Jesus, we still have locked doors inside of our hearts and our minds, which both keep others out from being fully welcomed in, as well as keeping our true selves from seeing the light of day. It can be that fear of, what if? It can paralyze us from living free. And then there's Thomas. Thomas, the one who gets labeled as the doubter when in fact, if we were listening, sounds like he's the one who's not afraid to be outside. He wasn't there with the others behind the locked doors. He was out and about. He felt free to move around, not contained by the fear of the others. And yet, he was looking for proof. He wanted the cold, hard facts. He wanted to see, to touch, to have Jesus as he'd always known Jesus. But what about a Jesus who's asking to lead him in new ways? It seems that Thomas wasn't quite ready to step into the new paradigm that Jesus was giving his followers. That they, including Thomas, would follow Jesus in spirit. That this crew of Jesus' followers would now follow in the proverbial footsteps 
of Jesus. That they would become the embodied Christ in the world from here on out. Carrying not just the message of Christ raised from the dead, but acting as Christ in the world, on behalf of the world, just as Jesus did. For Thomas and his resurrection response, it seems to me he's having trouble believing that when it comes to discernment, they'll have to rely on prayer and communal discernment, and not through the direct words of Jesus like they've been used to. And that through this type of new discernment, they're going to have to figure out for themselves what it looks like for them in their context to be the body of Christ. And then we get to Acts. To Peter and the disciples before this council. What a stark contrast from their actions in John. Locking themselves behind doors for fear of the religious leaders, now they've come face to face. And if you were to flip a few verses back in Acts chapter 5, we'd find that the disciples have been preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and they are physically put in prison for it. From being trapped by their fear in John, to being imprisoned by the religious leaders in Acts, they have come full circle. But like the resurrection of Jesus, the story doesn't end there. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5 bursts open the doors and they walk out from prison. Because in trusting God and being rooted in God's love and call on their life, they discerned what they needed to do. They overcame their fears and they did it. No matter the consequences. And when the worst seemed to happen, it actually seems that God had a different ending to the story. I need to admit that I'm rarely there. Although I'd like to say that I'm fearless in living out the gospel, I know that there are times when my own fears of what others may say or do, or even my own fears of my discernment of God, hold me back. I've had times of feeling entrapped by fear, like the disciples in John. Of being like Thomas and feeling free to walk around, but demanding signs from God to assure me that I'm on the right path. The fearlessness of the acts of these apostles. That's the freedom that we know is offered to us, that ability to be unafraid as we move about in the world with such a deep trust of what God is doing in and through us that we can move ahead. No matter what doors, whether physical or emotional or spiritual, seem to be locked ahead of us, we can carry on assured of the work that God is calling us to do in the world. It's where, as Methodists, we may say that they were sanctified. They were free to be exactly who God had created them to be. But it's a process. Remember, it wasn't long before that they had locked themselves in a room because of fear. And yet they kept praying. They opened themselves up to the Holy Spirit. And they trusted the discernment of the community of what they were to do having a full transformation to live lives that were fearless. That's the kind of faith I want. It's not always the faith that I have, but it's the faith that I hope to have. And then there's Gamaliel. The teacher of Saul turned Paul. Gamaliel speaks to the crowd of the Sanhedrin in response to the apostles' witness. In a surprising turn, the Sadducees, who hold the most power on the Sanhedrin, and if you remember your gospel stories, are often feuding with the Pharisees, allow Gamaliel, a Pharisee, to speak. And his 
Is he in full support of these Jesus followers and calling the Sanhedrin to do their own discernment? Or is he condescendingly saying that the, this so-called prophet Jesus and his followers will be like the rest of the prophets they've seen? That like a weed, it'll spring up quickly, but then it'll die out eventually. We're not sure. And while I don't guess that many, if any of you here, feel like Gamaliel on the surface, because you're coming to a Christian church where we preach Jesus, who has been crucified and resurrected, I still wonder if there's something for us to learn from Gamaliel. As a deeply religious person, Gamaliel knew the traditions. He knew the passages. He knew what faithfulness to God looked like. And yet here came a group of rabble-rousers saying that there was more to God's faithfulness than what Gamaliel believed, taught, and lived into. These young ones brought up new ideas of how God was working in the world, and they were unashamed in living it out. I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down, but just in case, let me be very clear. Sometimes even those of us who have been on the journey of faith a long time, those of us who have put our own skin in the game, participated in the unfolding work of God's salvation in the world, sometimes even us have ways in which we are still being made perfect in God's love. Sometimes even we need to be made uncomfortable in our ways, in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our beliefs, in our actions. And that's most likely going to come from others making us uncomfortable. Whether it be people in our church community or outside. As Gamaliel says, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's from God, you won't be able to stop them. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. The Easter story, the love of God found in Christ Jesus that frees all people from bondage and imprisonment is a force that should change the whole order of society. Throughout the course of the history of the Christian church, we have seen this happen time and again that voices spoke out to name the ways in which faithfulness needed to be expanded in order for it to be truly faithful. In our own United Methodist Church's history, we've seen that at a time, half of the church believed that slavery was faithful. And thankfully, voices rose up and God's faithfulness prevailed, calling slavery and racism itself a sin. Along with this, we've had women's ordination for only about 60 years. And currently, we're in the midst of a continued fight for full inclusion of queer people in our midst, both inside the church, inside the Methodist church, and in our country. Discomfort can sometimes come from the outside. A discomfort and sometimes be the Spirit calling to us. Where do you find yourself today? Do you feel like one of these characters? Maybe you relate. Do you feel afraid like the disciples in John, or maybe like Thomas, you're looking for assurance that your discernment is clear? Or maybe you feel emboldened like the apostles in Acts. Maybe like Gamaliel. You're trying to discern where God might be shifting your own faithful belief and action. Friends, wherever you find yourself, know this. The God is at work in each one of these stories. If you flip back to John, if you look again in Acts, from the risen Savior showing up to the fearful disciples and the doubting Thomas to the Holy Spirit opening doors, for the fearless disciples and acts and stirring inside the hearts of Gamaliel to discern where God might be working anew, God shows up. Time and again, God shows up. 
And God's going to show up in your life too. God is going to invite you to participate in the world in ways that might surprise you. That may mean you have to take a step outside into that big world. That may mean that you have to understand discernment and a new way of where God is working in your life. That may mean being so emboldened that you go against what the leaders are saying and doing because you feel compelled by Christ to do it. Maybe by listening to the voices of those on the margins, calling you to a new level of faithfulness. This is the good news. It's the good news for all. For those inside, for those outside. For through it, we get to be the body of Christ in the world joining in the ways that God is already at work to free you and me and everyone else. Amen.